Without talent and being weak, he became leader of the strongest clan. If you dig my recaps don't forget to subscribe and smash that notification bell. In their childhood six kids made a pact to become treasure hunters in search of wealth and glory. While the protagonist didn't feel as excited about it all thinking he wasn't good enough the rest of the group was certain they would one day make it to the capital Zabrudia. In this world treasure hunters are like celebrities in the imperial capital traveling the world in search of ruins called treasure vaults where precious objects are stored. It's a dangerous job where adventurers face creatures known as phantoms. One of the top level clans in the capital called First Step is holding interviews at a bar to recruit new members. Since a hunter can't get far on their own, most try to join groups like this to become stronger. Unfortunately, the protagonist didn't make the cut. His name is Cry Andri, a shy boy who gets approached by a girl precisely because of his calm and introspective demeanor. In such a tense atmosphere around the bar, she thought this boy seemed friendlier and decided to strike up a conversation. Her name is Ruder Runbeck, a hunter who has just been promoted to level three. The girl extends her hand to greet the stranger, but he only says his name and doesn't respond to the handshake. Not paying much attention to it, Ruda comments on how many people showed up for the interview saying she had even tried hunting alone, but that the White Wolf's Den Vault was too much for her, which is why she wants to join a clan. Out of nowhere, an obnoxious man interrupts the conversation questioning how a level 3 hunter could have gone to the White Wolf's Den, stating that it's not a place for weaklings and that the first step is a renowned clan and won't accept a rookie like her. Ruda gets angry and replies that the ad allowed hunters of any level pulling out her daggers to go after the guy, but one of the clan members steps in to end the argument. Inside the bar Ruda is impressed by the number of people participating in the selection process as it's her first time in such an event. On the other hand, it's Cry's fifth attempt. Internally, he reflects that talented hunters rise quickly through the ranks and make a living, but those without talent have to cling to the few opportunities they get and keep trying until they succeed. Ruda asks about the group dressed in white that stands out and Cry explains they are the Ark Brave children of the Holy Spirit and the strongest among the clans recruiting. They manage to complete a level 7 vault with just 6 members. The man sitting with them is Ark Rodden, the silver lightning leader of the group. As a level 7 hunter he guarantees success for anyone he recruits, but as far as anyone knows he's never taken on anyone new in events like this. With that said, Ruda wants to know about the table at the back that no one is at. Cry explains, and the man who insulted Ruda earlier Greg Zangief reappears against the girl's wishes explaining that the table belongs to the group that founded First Step, they are the Stragi. Cry recalls that the Stragi are young talents who came to the capital a few years ago and are considered one of the strongest groups today. The clan's official name is Strange Grief. Curiously, they are the group formed by his childhood friends. Greg mentions that the Stragi are accepting new members after many years which is why the place is packed but that the clan's presence is just a rumor with nothing confirmed. Whether it's a rumor or not a warrior bursts in arrogantly declaring he's going to join Strange Grief and doesn't have time for losers. He claims he'll be the strongest hunter alive already at level 4 and is considering allowing the strongest group to recruit him. Suddenly a girl named Tino steps in to put him in his place. An Ark Brave member tries to stop her, but she's determined to do what her sister would do if she were there. By the way, Tino claims she's the one who deserves to join Strange Grief. The Ark Brave member reminds her that the Vice Master ordered her to stop causing trouble, but Greg adds fuel to the fire riling up the crowd and forming an improvised ring in the middle of the room. Before things get heated, Cry urges Ruta to leave. As the fight begins, the swordsman imbues his weapon with fire and attacks, but Tino completely ignores him and lands a kick on the wall in front of Cry knocking him to the ground and blocking his escape. For some reason she calls him Master and asks how long he's been there. Rodden welcomes the boy revealing that he is in fact the master of the Stragi clan. In this golden era of hunters, the capital of Zabrudia has brought forth one of the brightest talents in recent times, a man who stands above all others, the level 8 treasure hunter Cry Andri. This is an epic tale filled with glory and hardship of how Cry became the leader of the group he founded in his childhood, now the strongest clan in existence. Part of the story begins a few years ago when the Stragi had just arrived in the capital but were already breaking records by completing beginner treasure vaults. One day during an expedition Cry was too distracted to notice
noticed the approach of a monster that almost killed him but a companion saved him at the crucial moment. All the members of this team shared the same dream of becoming treasure hunters, but while the other five were talented Cry was just an ordinary guy with little spark. If he had stayed with them Cry believes, he would have started holding them back at some point. But since his friends were too kind to admit it, he decided to make the choice for them and left the group. On that day, no matter how much Andre wanted to leave the red-haired swordsman, invited him to become the clan leader and everyone else loved the idea. In other words, from that moment on Cry Andre became the head of a group made up of his childhood friends all highly gifted, though he always longed to retire from his life as a hunter. Upon hearing Ark Rodden refer to the boy as the master of First Step Ruta and Greg could hardly believe it was real. Ark approached the boy to joke that only he could manage to be late to an event like this, while Tino blocked the man's way accusing him of being a fake pretty boy. Cry was supposed to be watching the crowd from the inside, but he wasn't even wearing his uniform. Since he overslept there was no time to get ready. In the leader's mind Ark wasn't just stubborn none of the clan members ever listened to him. Tino Shade for instance was just as hard-headed. Besides being a level 4 hunter affiliated with Pigata, she was also an apprentice to Cry's childhood friend Liz. At one point Cry asked Ark if he'd accept a new member if Cry vouched for someone's potential, and when Ark said yes the entire bar went wild with anticipation, except for Ark Brave's own members who made it clear they weren't interested in adding anyone new to the team. Uninvited to the conversation Tino mentioned, it would be an honor to be chosen, but that she had already decided to follow only her master so following the fake pretty boy would be a bit complicated. The kid with the flaming sword approached with the same swagger even after embarrassing himself in the fight, but Cry seemed intrigued and asked the boy's name. He replied that he was Gilbert Bush, the Blade of Purgatory. Cry thought the boy wouldn't be useful now, but with Ark's training he might be one day. Truth be told Cry wasn't great at making judgments, and anyone he picked would be sheer luck, so he threw caution to the wind and recommended Gilbert to Ark but with one condition. With that said Cry asked Gilbert what he thought was the most important thing for a hunter, but before waiting for a response he answered himself, it's to never lose. If a hunter lacks strength, the rest of the group is put in danger, so the candidate must demonstrate the ability never to be defeated. And if you're thinking that's impossible, Cry Andre himself has never been defeated in his entire career, which is true though he's never actually been in a fight, but that part he conveniently leaves out. In any case, Cry raised one of his rings and promised to recommend anyone to Ark Brave who could retrieve this treasure. With that, he threw the ring on the ground and Gilbert prepared to grab it, but Tino kicked the guy square in the face, causing him to drop the ring and nearly die from the force of the blow. Without delay, the entire bar erupted into a brawl over the ring, except for Ruta and Greg. Casually Cry said his goodbyes to the pair, pulled up his hood and calmly walked out as the bar descended into chaos behind him. The next day Stragi's leader made the headlines following the recruitment debacle at Ark Brave. He asked his vice master who was holding the newspaper if any civilians had been hurt. Eva Renfied replied that no one had but the Adventurers Association wanted to deal with the mess. Not in the mood for it Cry asked if Ark Rodden had read the article. Eva said he had and laughed so the the leader instructed her to charge the full cost of repairing the bar to the Silver Lightning and have him handle the Adventurers Association. Hearing this, Eva complained that the leader relied too much on Ark, especially since the association had specifically asked Cry to go in person. Indeed, Cry knew that Lieutenant Gark wouldn't let this slide, so he decided to head there himself, but not without a disguise and an escort. He chose the reverse face to bring along a mask of alteration that allows its wearer to have any face they want. Eva thought no one would simply attack the leader at this hour, so the young man dropped the drama. A little while later at the Adventurers Association standing before Gark Welter manager of the Zabrudia Adventurers Association Cry Andre kneeled desperately begging for forgiveness for all the damage caused explaining that once the fight started there was no turning back but at least no civilians were harmed which was the most important thing. After all a ton of bricks is nothing but a life is worth everything and not one was lost. Besides 
Besides Cry was an old friend of the bar's owner, so the guy would forgive everyone. Lastly completely out of context the boy nervously admitted that he'd love some ice cream. With that as a form of punishment Gark handed him a book filled with missions that were either too embarrassing absurdly easy or ridiculously hard. Because of these traits hunters referred to this kind of work as paying a penance and the boy had to choose one. Thus Cry searched for an easy mission in the book to pass on to Ark and picked a level 3 rescue mission called Bone Collection. After he left Gark and his companion commented that Stragi's leader hadn't changed a bit and probably didn't even realize he'd taken the most dangerous job. When Cry got home he was so frustrated to find Ark wasn't around that he completely ignored Tino's attempts to show him that she had retrieved the challenge ring. After some persistence the boy congratulated her for the accomplishment and asked if she was free. Tino excitedly said yes but when she realized Cry was going to assign her a mission she bolted. Seeing this, the leader summoned his wolf chain which formed into Silver and sent the chain after Tino. In no time Silver subdued the poor girl and she confessed she only wanted to have ice cream with her leader but now she'd have to go on a mission to rescue five people even though she was only level four. But she wouldn't be going alone because Cry had just recruited an improvised group with Gilbert Ruda and Greg to accompany Tino to the White Wolf's nest. Going back six years the most powerful clan in the region, which didn't even have a name at the time arrives at the Adventurers Association to register their group. Cry as usual tries to dissuade the team from moving forward and doesn't even want to enter, but his companions aren't about to give up at this stage. Despite his lack of confidence he claims he'll only hold the team back, but his friends insist on having the guy as their leader no matter what and there's no backing down now. Since Cry was being a pain, the boldest of the group steps up kicking the door open as he marches into the association with all the swagger in the world introducing himself as Luke Sikol, the best swordsman in the world. At his side Liz Smart tells the guy not to hog all the spotlight so she humbly introduces herself as the most powerful blade in the universe. Then Luke goes on to explain to a staff member that he's the most incredible of all because as Cry always says, those who are truly strong don't choose their weapon, and if Luke uses a wooden sword it's obvious he's the most dangerous. With nowhere to hide his face all Cry wants is for the red-headed delinquent to stop mentioning him like that to others. Either way it's time for the kid to register the clan's name and symbol, so the receptionist hands the rookie leader a piece of paper. According to her a team's name represents its spirit. Since the youngsters hadn't even thought about this detail, it meant Cry had to come up with something on the fly. In his head, it was the perfect chance to pick a terrible name so they drop him as leader. So he drew a strange skull and named the team Strange Grief. Absolutely everyone in the group thought the name was awful so Cry used it as proof of his lack of leadership skills. But just as he threatened to step down all his friends backtracked and decided to adopt the name as if it were the most genius thing ever. And that's how the Strange Clan was born. Fast forward to the present day and Greg is left speechless upon discovering that the skinny lifeless looking kid is actually the master of the Pagata's clan known as A Thousand Tricks. Hearing this name Cray Andre reflects that it was the second title he earned as the leader of Strange because the most renowned treasure hunters usually get special names from the association and become idols. Even with everyone insisting Gilbert Bush refuses to believe this kid is all that great so Tino who never liked the guy starts complaining to the boss that there's no way she can work with this fake swordsman. And Speaking of fake, Cry himself considers himself the biggest fraud in Zabrudia because if there's one thing he's not it's the strongest in the capital as people say. But that's thanks to his clanmates constantly running their mouths proclaiming strange grief as the best thing since sliced bread. Anyway Cry wants to know if the guests are down for the mission and Gilbert is the first to respond saying this is all a joke because it's an insult for such dead weight to be at level 8. Greg tries to warn him that he's picking a fight with the wrong person person, but the swordsman doesn't care about anyone telling him what to do. So Cry shows no interest in the argument and kicks Gilbert out of the mission. With that settled, he asks Greg and Ruta if they're in, and they confirm. Gilbert, furious with the situation, expects the Master of Strange to beg for his approval, but Cry couldn't care less about the guy's refusal. Instead, Cry asks Tino to let him know if she needs anything. 
and she takes the chance to tell him she does need the master, but he makes it clear that's not happening. With everything resolved Andre turns to leave, but Gilbert Bush challenges the thousand tricks, and if he loses he'll join the group. Cry tells him that the leader of the group is Tino Shade so it's her he'll be facing. Tino never one to hold back declares she'll deliver divine punishment against Bush, using the incredible range she developed through rigorous training. Feeling confident the swordsman promises not to hold back and challenges Cry again once he's done beating her. The last thing Cry wants is to fight obviously but Tino catches the challenger's attention warning him that although she's the same level 4 as Gilbert, she's still trash compared to the master. To make the fight even more thrilling she drops her weapons and decides to take on the opponent with her fists. Cry figures Tino should be able to handle this cocky guy but that sword he uses the blade of purgatory might tip the scales or even turn the fight in his favor depending on the skills the user has. However Gilbert mirrors his opponent's move and lets go of his weapon as well. Tino announces that after she destroys this guy she'll go have ice cream with the master but Cry doesn't seem too excited about the idea. The rogue throws a tantrum to get what she wants so the boss relents just to keep the peace. Motivated Tino now has the perfect excuse to fight like there's no tomorrow and with that in mind she charges at Bush with surprising speed. Gilbert narrowly dodges the first blow, but there's nothing he can do about the leg sweep that comes next, and so he takes his first beating of the day. Determined the guy doesn't give up and strikes back at the girl, but she easily dodges the attack and mocks him for challenging her master. Even though he seemed completely beaten Gilbert makes a comeback and regains control of his body. Then Shade lands a slap on the guy's neck putting an end to the poor man. Or at least that's what what everyone thought. Because while the others had already written the swordsman off as defeated, he digs deep into an old memory and remembers that he was born to be a hunter. From a very young age he could outmatch even some adults in swordsmanship, and it didn't take long for him to grow up and head to the capital to chase the career he so badly desired. Soon enough he had formed a group and sold off several treasure vaults, and this success gave him the feeling that he was invincible. Now faced with the present situation he snaps back to reality as his rival calls out to him. She tells him that he better use his sword if he wants any chance of surviving. Gilbert refuses, but she warns that pride means nothing when you're dead. Whether he likes it or not the swordsman agrees, though the truth is he can't accept being weaker than his opponent. Cry steps in and tells Gilbert that they're quite similar. Just like Bush left his last group because of the strength gap between him and the others Cry went through the same thing. But in Cry's case no one was left behind, or rather they they didn't let him stay behind no matter how much he wanted to. But Cry leaves that unsaid. Hearing this Gilbert is struck by the idea that Cry is benevolent, even with the most feared clan in the capital. He starts to see the thousand tricks as some kind of entity. Meanwhile, Andre touches the defeated man's sword identifies the elemental damage and enhanced attack range and remarks that it's a simple but good weapon so the swordsman should take care of it. Realizing that this man used his sword far better than he ever could reaching a flame he'd never grasped despite having had the blade for years Gilbert Bush yells that this is impossible and calls the leader of Strange a monster. Next cry Andre explains that mana material is considered the world's fundamental substance, but despite being everywhere it can't be seen with the naked eye. Treasure vaults are a phenomenon where spiritual lines and other forces condense mana material manifesting limited alternate worlds based on memories drawn from the core of the world. The rules governing this phenomenon are studied in many kingdoms, but they are still not fully understood. The White Wolf's Nest is one of those treasure vaults. It was originally inhabited by lupine monsters is called Silver Moon, but they were hunted to extinction for their pelt. Afterward the vault appeared along with a blood-stained ghost in the form of a wolf. After reading this in the newspaper, the young man gets a bit scared and points out that a treasure vault that's a vengeful reflection of history is a bit too much. Eva Renfied argues that it was Cry himself who put the group in this situation, but he assures her that his team has the level to overcome the challenge since the vault is level 3 and they'll have 4 people plus Tino 
is coming along. By the way, the boy thanks her for telling him that Gilbert Bush had left the group because he was able to use that information at just the right moment. Moving on the clan's vice master mentions that the master put on quite a show with a relic in the training room. He replies that it was easy to control especially since even Gilbert managed to use it a little without any real knowledge. Speaking of which, Cry loves collecting relics with all kinds of powers and shapes. By the way, he'd love to know if Bush would sell the Purgatory Blade. Hearing this, Eva loses her patience and points out that the boss already has several relics similar to that sword, and on top of that he even took out a loan from Citri due to debts. Even though he receives an equal commission with all the other strange members, the clan doesn't generate infinite money. Embarrassed, Cry looks for a counterargument, but can only remember that he needs someone to recharge his relics. So he goes to two allies, and while the woman is recharging the relics, the man tells him that a ghost in the shape of a wolf appeared near the white wolf's nest and destroyed an entire caravan with level 3 escorts. Cry thinks his team will handle it without any issues, but the man stresses that the ghosts in the area have been growing stronger. The woman adds that Rudolph Devu, a powerful level 5 lancer, has also shown up there and Cry remembers that this guy is on the wanted list for the guild job he took. Worried that the mission might fail, the leader hopes Gilbert has recharged the Purgatory Blade. Speaking of the team which is already on its way to the Nestino, doesn't help the atmosphere by revealing that she left a will before setting out. After all, if her master sent her on this mission, it means it won't be easy. Still, she believes that Andre would never assign her a random group. On the other hand, every other member of the group, except for Tino, thinks this is the most random team possible. Either way, Gilbert accepted the job because the thousand tricks knew even why he left his old group. Tino explains that the guy is a genius at deduction and has extensive knowledge about the capital and its surroundings so he must have deduced this fact from Gilbert's words. Ruta doubts this quite a bit, but Greg figures that only such a methodical mind could have coldly calculated that bar incident. Taking advantage of this speech, Tino reinforces that the master planned everything for the mission to go smoothly without major scares and would never send a group to their deaths without careful thought. And speaking of the devil, after sending a group to their deaths, without thinking Cry decides to catch up with them in time to order them to abort the mission. Back with the team, they barely arrive before encountering a ghost wielding a sword and shield at a level well beyond that of humans. Meanwhile, Cry is rummaging through endless clutter searching for relics. Eva scolds him for carrying a citri slime which is banned by Imperial law, but the boy doesn't have time to waste and will have to make do. So he takes off flying with this broken and unstable relic which might just make this young man's last flight. Years ago during the early days of strange grief, it had only been a week since the clan began operating in the capital of Zabrudia and Gilbert was already fuming because his ultimate divine sword which he had named Blade of the Testament had shattered like it was nothing more than a twig. Other envious members joked that fighting ghosts with a stick would be tough while Tino Shade remarked that she hadn't expected to find a cyclops in a level 1 vault since those monsters were level 4. Listening in on the conversation, a drunken tavern customer approached the group calling the kids rookies, insisting that a cyclops would never appear in the goblin cave and even if it had there was no way they would have survived. At that two female members of the clan stepped closer to the drunk and showed him the cyclops much to the adventurer's shock. Cry reflecting on the scene thought to himself that this was exactly why he hadn't wanted to bring the creature along. Fast Fast forward to the present day, Gilbert Bush slices a werewolf in half with his sword. Exhausted from the fight, Ruta complains that this kind of monster should never show up in a level 3 vault. Similarly, Greg doesn't understand why the Blade of Purgatory hadn't ignited during the battle to which its owner explains that the sword is out of mana and he can't recharge it on his own. Ruta begins to think it might be better to retreat for now and Greg adds that the situation is indeed different from what they were told especially since under these circumstances the group they came to rescue is probably already dead. After hearing everyone's input the leader Tino Shade decrees that the plan will not be changed. Anxious Greg asks whether survival isn't the top priority, but Tino firmly responds that they didn't come all this way to collect monsters, those they came to rescue are still alive. In fact, they're executing a perfect level 8 strategy, and the decision to deplete the Blade of Purgatory's mana was certainly part of the Master's plan. The group presses on toward the white 
White Wolf's den where humanoid wolves were armed with bows and firearms. This makes Greg realize that the ones they had defeated earlier weren't just randomly strong, but that the entire pack was highly skilled. Tino explains that this den was created to house the Silver Moon wolves who originally lived there. Gilbert rushes ahead eager to resolve the situation quickly figuring that once they handle the wolves with bows and firearms the rest will be easy. However, Tino warns him not to get reckless reminding him that as leader it's her duty to ensure everyone returns alive. With that she lays out a clear strategy. She and Ruta being the fastest will lure the enemy while the rest will attack from behind. At close range the firearms shouldn't pose much of a problem. Even if they end up in a dangerous situation, no one is to use another as a shield or a sacrifice. Meanwhile Cry silently prays that at least Tino survives, even if the rest of the group ends up being used as shields. Back with the team Tino acknowledges that the enemy is far superior in terms of skill, but they have one key advantage, teamwork. No matter how strong the opponent they don't understand the concept of cooperation. With that said more armed werewolves appear, and the group instinctively knows how to respond. Tino observes that even though they are an improvised team the setup isn't bad. Gilbert Bush might talk too much, but he's very competent. Greg Zangief with his wealth of experience works well with others. Ruta might not do anything flashy, but as a rogue she excels at locating enemies and without her Tino wouldn't be able to focus on the fight. With every aspect of the strategy falling into place Shade starts to believe that her master is a true genius for being so spot on. Meanwhile in the heat of battle Gilbert grows angry feeling as if he's being underestimated by the enemy. This feeling sends him back to an old memory one where he thought he was going through the same thing when he ordered his subordinates to be more tenacious. But his team couldn't keep up with him so Gilbert gave gave up and left the group on the spot. Maybe they had been trying their best, but over time the gap between them only widened. Back then the boy was full of rage, and it's only now that he realizes those people were giving it their all and he never considered how they felt. Now fighting side by side with others, he's reached a level of maturity where he understands that teamwork is always better. After another victory the team pushes forward in the White Wolf's den, reaching a strangely larger area than the previous ones. Tino places her hand on the wall, and senses a presence not the people they came to rescue but likely the den's boss. Greg asks if it might be wiser to flee but Tino points out that they've come this far without a scratch so they should be able to handle the boss. Even so Greg remains uneasy. Shade comments that he's way too cautious for someone who looks so tough and that safe missions never help anyone grow. Caution is good but sometimes you have to be bold. Greg admits that she's not entirely wrong after all once a hunter reaches level 4 they can make a living just by completing vaults below their level. Every time he thought he couldn't win Greg would stop confronting his enemy, which was a direct result of watching many of his friends die. Tino responds that although Greg has been a hunter for a long time, he came to the first step precisely to change that mindset and that's also why the master put him in the group. Otherwise it wouldn't make sense for Cry to have chosen someone he barely knows. Actually Cry wanted to save everyone there meaning the master is like a god and there's no way he assembled that team randomly. He'd never stoop to such a ridiculous role. Everything he does is calculated and must align perfectly with his infallible plan, which is always executed surgically through complex strategies. In other words, Shade repeats once again that Cry Andri is a true god. On that note, Ruta is eager to understand why she was chosen for the team and Tino is left without a clue on how to respond, so he just observes her searching for an answer. It quickly dawns on her that the reason is obvious, Ruta is very beautiful. The newcomer looks like she's about to complain, but before she can the leader cuts off the small talk and calls the group to continue their journey. Speaking of the cold and calculating god, Cry begins to panic, as he has no idea where the group he sent is. To make matters worse the relic he's using to fly is basically an airplane without brakes which is obviously dangerous. However despite all the bumps along the way he manages to crash into the white wolf's den completely by accident. Meanwhile, Tino Shade and the others face the dungeon boss, a giant white wolf. The moment the enemy makes its first move the entire group pulls back clearly anxious because there's no denying that this wolf is incredibly powerful. The team becomes hesitant disorganized torn between fighting and fleeing. Shade observes that the boss isn't wearing a helmet which must be its weak spot. This is probably one of the thousand challenges set by her master cry so she must ensure she passes the test. With that in mind, she orders
orders Gilbert to block one of the wolf's strikes while she takes care of the rest. Gilbert steps up bracing his sword against the overwhelming force of the beast's axe, holding it off for a moment. Greg attacks one of its legs, but the wolf manages to fling the warrior away with its left front paw. Tino charges forward fearlessly against the opponent leaving Ruda in awe of his determination. Greg loses his sword after it takes a heavy blow from the axe shattering the blade. As the wolf winds up for a second strike Ruder rushes in to save him pushing him aside just in time. Tino Shade seizes the moment climbing up the wolf's axe handle and making her way to its head. During the leap to deliver the final blow, she suffers a deep scratch but manages to stick to her plan and drive her sword into the creature defeating it once and for all. After their victory Shade realizes her wound is quite serious but she has a healing potion ready which eases the situation. Greg laments his broken sword but Gilbert points out that he should be thankful it wasn't his head instead. Eventually the big guy thanks Ruta for saving him and they remember there's still a rescue mission ahead. Tino hands over her sword to Greg since he's now unarmed but at that moment a giant spear is hurled at the leader barely missing her chest. As they gather their bearings four more giant white wolves begin to appear identical to the one they thought was the dungeon boss. Even Tino feels the pressure and realizes that her master has put them through a challenge far tougher than expected. Faced with this overwhelming situation, she orders everyone to flee through the nearest passage on the right, knowing that the narrow path will hinder the wolves' movements. However, one of the wolves blocks the way so Greg suggests that Tino and Ruta being quicker escape through the passage while he and Gilbert sacrifice themselves for the group. But the leader insists that no one should be sacrificed commanding each member to aim for the wolves' eyes and organizing the team for a new offensive. The attack formation quickly falls into place with Gilbert taking the lead ready to face death head-on. With his sword he blocks one of the wolves' attacks followed by Greg striking but both are thrown back. Ruta hurls shurikens at another wolf's eyes, but the creature shuts them just in time. Tino then prepares a technique she developed under Cry's training using an accessory that emits a bright flash to blind one of the wolves. Seizing the opportunity Gilbert attacks, but even blinded the wolf manages to hurl him against the wall with force. Tino chastises herself for a poor strategy that put a team member in danger. And now it seems like everything is about to end the team is surrounded with no resources left to fight. At that moment Cry accidentally crashes into the scene taking out a wolf with his wild flight. The remaining wolves hesitate to attack after witnessing such power but one advances with its sword. Cry using one of his accessories blocks the blow and fires projectiles with another bringing the creature down. With 17 security rings at his disposal Cry can do quite a lot in battle but he just wants to go home not even caring about finding the people he was supposed to rescue. To quickly end the situation he tosses his pendant into the air and detonates it with one of his rings creating a distraction for the group to escape. Soon everyone is retreating although Tino is wounded and slower than the others. Gilbert complains about the pace but Ruta points out that the group's leader is setting the pace for the injured rogue. In reality though Cry is running as fast as he can which happens to be as slow as the injured girl. Thinking the master is being considerate Tino remembers that his kindness has always been one of his defining traits. A long time ago when she was still a child she was in trouble with two guys until strange grief showed up to save her. Ever since then she's wanted to be like them. After putting some distance between themselves and the wolves the group takes a break and Cry uses another relic to heal Tino's wounds. Gilbert remarks somewhat disdainfully that the guy uses an item for everything but Cry doesn't care. They continue on their way under Cry Andre's leadership, though he has absolutely no idea what he's doing much less how to get out of this situation. Years ago when he was still a child he would always impress his clanmates with the number of relics he had under his control. Having always been a fan of such items he made a point of saving up money to buy as many as he could. Liz asked if Cry would use one that suited her, but Luke thought that would be unfair since the leader should use relics that benefit the whole group. Tino remarked that now it would pay off for the leader to be a hoarder as she would finally be rewarded for acting as their battery. Liz wanted to know what relic she had in her hands, so the owner explained that it was a magic pouch capable of carrying far more items than one might imagine. Tino assumed the bag must have been expensive, but to the contrary Cry explained it was very cheap because it could only store chocolate. With that Tino realized there's nothing more useless than that. Liz caught the leader's attention by showing off a bracelet she loved, but soon after she was thrown to the ground twice 
twice without being able to react. Embarrassed Cry explained that it was a labyrinth ring which messed with your sense of space once worn. Meanwhile, Luke Sicole found himself stuck to a sword to which Cry revealed it was cursed. After that, Luke was overwhelmed by a mad desire to kill people. Fortunately, those dangerous relics were later turned into training tools for Luke and Liz. Fast forward to the present, Cry's current group was walking through the narrow corridors of the White Wolf's Nest. Cry noticed these corridors split continuously which meant that no matter how far you walked everything always looked the same and there was no way to tell where you were. To make matters worse for some reason Cry was leading the way as if he could guide the team even though the rogues were Tino and Ruta. At that moment Cry glanced back discreetly causing everyone else to do the same. In truth he just wanted to see if Tino would look back at him as he was worried she might be hating him by now for dragging her into this crazy mission. Since she looked back along with the others, the kids started to think she didn't want to talk to him anymore and all sorts of anxieties came rushing in. Even though she had always said she adored him, it seemed Cry had messed up big time and he figured he'd have to apologize on his knees. Then Gilbert asked if they were heading toward the exit prompting Cry to look back again dragging everyone into the same motion. Internally, the leader reflected that of course they were heading for the exit, he just didn't know the way. Tino informed the swordsman that figuring out the master's plan was part of the training and revealed they had never been walking toward the exit. This time even Cry was surprised so she added that she had checked the map before they left and had some sense of the cave's pathways. As for the route they were on no matter how much they insisted on it, they would never reach the exit that way. If they wanted out they'd have to return to the boss chamber. Upon hearing this Cry realized he had been screwing up especially since he hadn't even known those giant wolves were the bosses. Now it was Ruta's turn to ask where they were headed, even though she understood it was part of the plan, but Cry remained silent as he had no clue what he was doing. In fact, he just wished everyone wouldn't act as if they depended on him. Either way, he continued walking in silence. Suddenly, after Cry took a turn ahead, the other members were captivated by what lay in the opposite direction and Tino once again reiterated that everything her master did was for a reason. With that said, everyone ran in the opposite direction of where Cry had turned. Confused he went to check what was happening and discovered that the soldiers they had come to rescue were down that corridor. The soldiers leader Rudolf Devout thanked the newcomers for rescuing him and Tino Shade gave all the credit to her master as he had always known what he was doing. Cry replied that it seemed more like a coincidence which left Gilbert puzzled by this strange remark from the leader while Greg noted that it only made him more mysterious and indecipherable. Ruta mentioned she had given some potions to the wounded, but they were exhausted and needed food. Given that Cry pulled out his pouch that stored infinite chocolate and distributed it to the soldiers, Gilbert asked how that thing worked, but Cry said it was a secret. Greg stated that when he heard the missing soldiers were level 5, he was sure there must have been some mistake, but Rudolph revealed that they too had been caught off guard as no one had expected those enemies to be so strong. Gilbert acknowledged that the wolves were strong, but he was surprised they could subdue level 5 soldiers. However, Rudolph clarified that it wasn't the wolves that had done that, but a lone enemy, a small ghost with a face fully covered by a skull as if it were the embodiment of resentment. That ghost was probably the manifestation of the Silver Moon's curse that lingered there as after the humans exterminated the wolves their hatred accumulated inside the vault and turned into that absurd power. At least that's the theory Rudolph believed to be correct as he couldn't imagine any other explanation. He and his men had been confident, but that ghost seemed to be on the same level as the Thousand Swords, the greatest swordsman in the capital who had formal sword training with the Sacred Blade, a lunatic capable of defeating anyone with a wooden sword. Thinking about it, Cry knew well that this man was his childhood friend and a member of Stragri and his name was Luke Sikol. Cry imagined that ghost was strong, but thought it was an exaggeration to place it on the same level as the Thousand Swords. In any case, Luke wasn't there and Tino wouldn't be able to defeat that ghost so Cry regretted not waiting for Ark. In the end, he suggested that everyone should leave before they encountered this creature. But since Tino Shade was the mission leader, everyone had to respect her decision. Tino responded that she was trash compared to her master, but Cry assured her that it was part of the training, and if the rogue needed help he would step in. In truth, Cry was just tired of leading and wanted to shove that responsibility onto someone else, but in any case Shade accepted the challenge and agreed that the best course of action was to get out of there as quickly as possible. After resuming their 
their journey Tino leads everyone to the exit. Rudolph begs to stay behind and buy time while his companions are taken back but the leader assures them that as long as the master is present everything will be fine and everyone will return home safely. Hellion one of Rudolph's subordinates insists that being the shield is his role as his superior only accepted this mission because of him. Still Cry says they can resolve that once they're safe in the capital. At that moment dozens of howls echoed throughout the cave and Cry calculates that he has five safety rings left. On the sixth time he will die for real. To make matters worse he no longer has relics to use and the shooting ring won't be enough to stop the enemies from advancing. As if that wasn't enough the citri slime has disappeared and the sword tied to his waist has fallen somewhere. Under these circumstances Cry Andre wonders if this is the end. Meanwhile a mysterious figure walks through the misty corridors of the cave and teleports elsewhere. Amid everything that's happening Cry's group assumes that something very serious is about to occur and Rudolph prepares for what's coming. Cry steps in front of Tino and assesses that if he uses the Night Hiker and becomes a human missile, he will die once, but at least he'll manage a surprise attack. Then four purple flames light up the room, revealing the much-talked-about ghost. Instantly, everyone is stunned by the imposing presence of the enemy and starts trembling in fear. Behind the ghost, another mysterious figure appears with a sword leading Tino to begin saying a final goodbye to her master, while Cry wonders what Liz Smart is doing there. Without delay, as the ghost looks back Liz teleports to his flank and delivers a powerful kick slamming the monster against the wall. After that she returns the sword Cry had lost and explains that she came running but was saddened and embarrassed to hear that the leader had gone to a vault. She couldn't believe Cry was the type who worried too much, nor that his own apprentice Tino Shade couldn't even pick up trash properly. As she says this Liz grabs Tino by the arms. Gilbert tries to say something about it but Liz kicks him in the chest warning that she She's in the middle of an apology. Then she asks Tino whether it was incompetence during training or a lack of ambition on the student's part. After calmly asking this, the teacher loses her composure entirely and curses her out saying she'll die in the gutter before causing problems for Cry's name. Tino reacts by kneeling and begging for forgiveness for being worthless and awful so Cry steps in saying that Tino did great on today's mission and that Liz is also doing an excellent job. Hearing her master's praise Liz feels proud of herself and points out that all Tino lacks is the will to die. At that moment a giant wolf arrives in the area wielding a minigun that fires wildly at the humans. Liz puts her mask back on and practically stops time grabbing one of the bullets flying toward her. When the wolf finishes shooting she drops the bullet to the ground furious that the opponents underestimated her thinking they could defeat her with such a pathetic little weapon. Then she complains that her pupil was scared of this toy ruining her reputation as a master. With that she leaps at the giant wolf and lands a kick to its head dragging it to the ground leaving a trail of energy that explodes insanely. In the midst of the explosion the woman screams that killing enemies however you like is the most fun thing on the face of the earth. With that done only the ghost and his sword remain. He attacks Liz with impressive speed but she stops the blade mid-strike with just one hand teaching her student that this is what should be done and such a move doesn't require any extra extraordinary effort. Then she knees the ghost in the stomach and follows up with a punch that sends him crashing to the ground. According to the member of Strange Grief, just kill your enemy, so they don't attack you always attacking with everything you've got even if it risks your own life. While passing on these teachings to Tino, the teacher calls her stupid and every other name imaginable to the point of making the girl cry. In the middle of this beatdown, Cry observes that this ghost would have no chance against the Thousand Swords and that it was precisely the battles between Liz and Luke that caused Stragri to evolve so much. Nowadays Liz Smart is faster than anything in this world, earning her the nickname Broken Shadow. Back in the capital after their victory Gilbert Bush announces that Cry can keep the Sword of Purgatory because he plans to restart his journey from scratch and before long will be able to catch bullets in mid-air like the Broken Shadow. Hearing this Tino Greg and Ruta don't believe it for a second, but the boy just wants to dream and be happy. But since he wants to be as strong as as Liz Smartino has a piece of advice about Stragri's personalized masks. Six years ago Cry Andri had messed up the mask order for his clan and ended up requesting some without even eye holes. Even so all the members thought it was awesome and officially adopted the accessory.